record on. Okay, recording is on. Okay, so well, thanks to the second session of uh, the alumni talks we hold with people who have been students at our college. And for people who do not know me or Jeanne, uh, especially welcome to the people who come from outside the college. Uh, I see there are a couple of uh, uh, people who come from outside as well. So I'm uh, there are quite a number of students as well. So for the people who do not know us, uh, I'm Peter Klees. Uh, I'm permanent professor in the economics department. And Jeanne Mouton is uh, one of the three assistants uh, to the department, uh, who is uh, one of the three academic assistants. Um, we hold these talks in order to know a little bit with the students, to reach out to our alumni and know how they are doing, how they are doing once they finish studies. And we hold a talk last week with people mostly from the commission and some um, uh, research agency on climate in Berlin. And today we have the chance to speak to two people who are more not in academics or nor in the institutions, but again, in different uh, groupings. So Mahmoud and Corina, they are both here uh, working in consultancy and in uh, an agency. So we'll be happy to have a couple of presentations by, by both. Uh, Jeanne, you will moderate the, the talk. Uh, we are happy to welcome any questions you may have on uh, what their experience has been at the college, what they thought was the most important things, how they use the knowledge they got in the college uh, now, in the current job, or any other question you may think as well. Oh, sorry, well, start again. Welcome to both of you. And it would be great if you could, uh, both Eduardo and Karina, tell us about uh, your background, present yourself, present your career path. And then I think we can leave the floor to students as uh, even before the recording, if we're the one students already starting to ask questions to Eduardo. So I'm sure they will have many questions for you. If maybe, um, Karina, you want to go first. Mm. Happy to hear about uh, your experience. Okay. Uh, sure, sure. So, hi everyone, and thank you for having me. I really hope uh, I can uh, I can help or um, guide you a little bit, and that will be useful to you. Um, so, I'm Karina. I was an EAB student um, at during the Marine Promotion, so 2019, I believe. Um, so, a little bit about myself. So, yes, I'm currently at uh, Deloitte as a consultant. Um, and uh, I've been in consulting for a while. After the, the college, I immediately joined consulting here in Luxembourg, um, uh, although I, I switched firms. And um, I don't know how much in detail I should go right now, so please, I don't know, let me know if I should detail it more or not. But um, as, a, as a bit of a background for myself, so I'm uh, initially a business school student. I did a bachelor in business administration in France, and. Um, uh, master's in e-commerce in Canada, and um, after that, I worked for a year at Deloitte Luxembourg before coming to the college. And yes, as I said, after the college, I went back to to consulting in Luxembourg in the financial industry. Thank you. Well, we'll keep the question for later. And Eduardo, on a completely different uh, aspect, so we have Corina who's coming from us, Nana is from Deloitte, and Eduardo writing a PhD thesis. We Published one of his research papers as a research paper of the uh, economics department. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have some slides uh, of my presentation, but uh, I don't know if because I think I cannot share it. So if you have to unlock me, yeah, now I can. Just give me a sec. Um... Like now you can see the slides now. See me a second.
Oh, I don't know what's like. I'm not really. What, what, you can use the slides? No. I cannot hear you anything. Yeah, because I, I lost the signal. Can you hear me now? I can go without, yeah, I can go. Yeah, I will go without the slides. I can send to you, Jan, maybe, because they have some links that can be of the interest of the student. So, um, I'm Eduardo, I'm from the Hana Ale promotion. So I did the Coelia track. So one of these uh, queer people, we were just four people in my promotion uh, doing uh, law and economics. And right after the college, I started a PhD position in Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And currently I'm visiting the Bocconi University in Milan, in Italy. So here I am now in Italy and also I'm a fellow of a Marie Curie a fellow because I'm part of a project funded by the European Commission in the Horizon 2020 framework. Uh, so yeah, I would like to, to share my experience related to, to a PhD, you know, because at the end of my time in the college, I, I really wanted to do a PhD after the, the college and I was sure about that. Uh, maybe for you, this is an option or maybe you didn't think about it, uh, but I mean, the, only, the first thing I would like to say is just if you are thinking about PSD, don't think that it's just for academia. So don't say, okay, if I'm good doing a PSD, I will stay in the university for my whole life and I'll be there. No, I have a lot of colleagues now working on international institutions, OECD, World Bank, International Monetary Fund, that they have a PSD and they require a PSD as a background to join these institutions. Uh, but also some agencies of the European Union, for example, the Twin Research Center, uh, the ECB has several positions open for PhD people. So maybe it's also a way to get into, into the European institutions. Also private firms and maybe Corina, I don't know if has some colleagues that uh, maybe has PhDs or they were involved in, in more academic training after a master. Um, and also, I would like to, to tell you a little bit more about these uh, Marie Curie actions with our project funded by the, the European Commission. So maybe for you it's uh, of interest because, I mean, you are on new topics and uh, these kind of uh, positions are really policy related uh, actions. So, for example, in my case, I'm working on for my specialization, which is the regional industrial innovation policy in the European Union. Uh, so actually, you can see the like the, the the topic you're working on is really related to to policy uh, decision making process in, in Europe and trying to give the evidence based policy for for policy makers. So I think it can be interesting for you also because they have several formats and in my case it's a uh, it's called an international training network. So we are in a police uh, and um, in a project called Polis. Uh, we are seven European uh, universities, and we have uh, LSC, Bocconi, Utrecht, uh, also from Politecnico Valencia, Vienna, Pesk, in Hungary, and Stavanger in Norway. And we are 14 PhDs that started at the at the same time, so this is also very nice because I mean normally when you do a PhD it can be kind of lonely or individual job because you are just doing your research, but in this case. We are people working on the same topics, but from different approach. So we have people working, I don't know, from the role of universities in knowledge diffusion to migrants to globalization, but all related to industrial and innovation development in EU regions. So uh, you see that the, the topics are, I mean, they have uh, on all of, maybe all the DGs has like topic related. I don't know if you're interested in trade, in agriculture, so you will also find position on that. There's a website that is, it was in my slides, but maybe you can ask uh, Jan to, to have it. It's called EuroAccess, and they publish a lot of offers on PSDs funded by, by this kind of uh, actions by the European Commission. Maybe you, you can have a look to it. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, uh, some tips or things that I would like to have known before applying for a PhD when I was in the college, because at my time, we didn't have the opportunity to, to like uh, be in this kind of meetings. Uh, but uh, something that I will tell you, if you are considering to go for a PhD, 
maybe try to talk to everyone, like literally everyone, the students, academic assistants, professors, because I mean, you are in a great institution now, so you have to take advantage of that. You have visiting professors coming from universities across Europe. So you have to talk with them, say, I don't know, maybe in your university, there will be a position that can be fit in my profile. If you heard something, you can send to me. I received several offers universities uh, related to professor in the college and my time there so it's, it's a network you have, you have to take advantage also your colleagues i mean your, your your colleagues in class they might know about the former universities uh, you, you already i think know about this sorry for spamming the message that you get in the email of, of the college uh, maybe that's a way to find a phd that was in my case actually I received the offer in the college mail from alumni so try to to get uh, these opportunities. Um, yeah, nothing. Uh, I will have. I will give the to Jan my like my email and everything in case you want to to contact me. But, uh, happy now to answer all your questions and maybe help you in, in the future if you are trying to or considering to apply for a PhD or to I don't know receive feedback on applications, uh, research proposal. Or whatever. Yeah, thank you. Leaving the floor to students, I will have one or two questions for both of you. First, uh, why did you choose the job you're working in? Why, Corina, are you working as an analyst in Deloitte? Why as an analyst and why in Deloitte? And Eduardo, what was the trigger for you to start a PhD? Um, should, should I go first? Or? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so I. I'm a consultant because before joining the college, I was, uh, was already in consulting and I liked it a lot. It's just, I, I changed, um, fields, but I liked, uh, the, the consulting uh, challenges and the fact that you get to work on so many different, uh, different projects and, uh, you get so many different, um, uh, types of, of projects. So you, you don't do the same thing. You change constantly and that I really like the challenges and you learn a lot. And I think, uh, at the beginning of a career is a real, uh, it's a real asset. Um, so now I'm, I'm a consultant in banking and, uh, I'm in a payments team and I, there was a, I wrote my thesis at the college on uh, payments and on the, on the payments, uh, services directive. So I was, uh, I was really interested in the field and I, I really wanted to learn more, more. And, uh, at the time consulting seemed like a, a good opportunity to, to have its experience and I knew I would like it. And Deloitte, uh, because it's the biggest consulting firm here in Luxembourg. So. Um, obviously it's, uh, the, the most interesting projects or most interesting clients, uh, are often here in Deloitte. So that's a, that's a good asset. Um, I was in a smaller firm before, so I can, I can also tell the difference in Deloitte. You can, uh, can do a lot more. You can work on a lot of internal initiatives and projects and, uh, and really have a good hands-on experience on the field you, you you're interested in. So it's, a, it's definitely a, a good firm to, to, to start as a junior because you get to see a lot of different things and work on things that you don't necessarily want to work, but you still, uh, you still learn. So that was for me, uh, that was important for me too. This is why I also went back to, to Deloitte. Yes. In my case, like there were two reasons, actually. The first one is because I love uh, doing research. For example, in the college, I really enjoyed my time. I mean, doing the thesis for sure it was a very stressing period, but uh, very rewarding. And I really like like uh, like to find uh, yeah, answers to, to questions. So, I mean, for me, research was the thing I wanted to do. And the natural way to continue on pursuing a, a research career, I think it's uh, doing a PhD. But also because, I mean, as I said, like the, the opportunities that uh, are open after doing a PhD, I think they're great. I mean, you can choose some very different uh, institutions at the end of the day, like so to go for academia, or you can also go to international institution, research institute. So you can have a lot of position to, to apply for. So I feel I, I, I'm not sure about what I will do in the future. But uh, it's a way to continue the, doing what I like, which is research, and yeah, maybe in the future try to get a, a nice uh, opportunity, a nice position. Uh, who knows where? It's great that you're saying it's, it's probably something that most students have a preconception about PhD that if you're writing PhD, it's to be a professor again. But it's true that you have so many. 
doors open afterwards. Um, maybe another question before leaving the floor, and then I leave the floor for students. Um, maybe a question that I was wondering, like, what is your everyday work? What is working as a consultant? What do you do on everyday? Is there a different project, but what is it working on this project? And as a PhD, what is the everyday life of a PhD student too? Corina, you want to start? Um, as you, want, you can go ahead this time if you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, it's like kind of, a, I would say, a research cycle, no? So, like, for example, last year, my PhD program was involved some some courses. So, actually, last year, I was a student, let's say. But uh, in a normal uh, life now, actually, I, I usually have to, I mean, for example, you have to start reading a lot of papers and you get more or less the, the subject that you want to do. Then you find your research question. And then you start uh, with the data and then you start like, writing a paper. No? So, but it really depends because in each of these uh, moments, the work is different. For example, now I'm more with the data part. So my day-to-day -day work actually is cleaning databases and trying to get the, the, the data in a nice way in order then to you know, run your uh, econometric models and try to to the quanti quantitative part. But uh, now that we're back in a normal life, for, for sure, I mean, here in, I'm, I'm happy that I'm in Italy, so I'm doing my second year here among like uh, surrounded by the great uh, scholars. And yeah, going to the office, working with other PhD, and now, as I said, like uh, cleaning data and preparing the data and to, to write uh, hopefully a nice paper after. Um, so for, for me, it really depends on the project I am on. So, uh, because the, the day to day life is, is completely different from one project to the other, but, um, so basically right now I was working on, uh, for instance, on a project, um, reorganization of, uh, of the audit department. So that wasn't really in, uh, in banking, but as I said, you, you don't always, uh, work necessarily on what you want to do. Um. And then uh, as a consultant, you really have to, to adapt to what uh, your client uh, expects you to do. So you will uh, you'll do so many things. You'll prepare reports for, uh, for steering committees. You will, uh, you will uh, for instance, I was drafting procedures. So that, uh, the big part of my, of my day was uh, organizing workshops with stakeholders to, to be able to define these processes and procedures. Um, and um, then as a, as I said, you can also work on uh, on side projects or internal initiatives, which means that at the end of your workday at the client, you will also have to uh, to work on I don't know preparing trainings or preparing articles, for instance, uh, client presentations uh, or uh, client uh, proposals. So it's really diverse. I cannot really give a, a standard day because it changes a lot, but it in really, really depends on your client. Also, if your client expects you to, for instance, to be on site or not, if not, then you can maybe also work on, on other site projects. Uh, if you have to go to the client, obviously, then you will be working on your project full time. Um, it really, it really depends on a, on a day to day basis and on a project basis. That's interesting to know that either for a PhD applicant or for consultants, there is no real standard day at the end. It's very diverse job. Okay, I'm leaving the floor to students. We had already some questions before the start of the recording. If the students would like to keep on, or if anyone would like to um, ask a question, please unmute yourself and you can ask it. Raise your hand if you're so ready. The floor is yours, Nuhana. Um, thank you. Um, so my question is to both of you. First of all, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, it was really nice to hear about the backgrounds. So the question would be, um, if there was one thing you would do differently during your College of Europe year, uh, during your master's, what would it be? Like what one thing you would do differently?
Um, yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, I I think from from my side uh, is that I was really really stressed during that year. There was so much to do that I was I was just stressed all the time, and I feel like I just didn't enjoy uh, my time as much. So maybe one thing that I would like to do differently, or I would have wanted to do differently, is to just uh, you know distress a bit and relax, and then enjoy enjoy it more. Uh, because uh, the year is so short and it passes by so so quickly, and I think uh, um, I think if you hear you you agree with me, it's uh, it seems long at the beginning, but then it's super super short, and uh, you really have to enjoy it because it's a, it's a great experience. And uh, for me, it was a big regret at the end, the feeling that I was just too stressed by uh, by classes and thesis and exams and so on. That sometimes I I kind of uh, forget what there is. Yes, I mean. I agree with with uh, what Corina said. Um, I mean, I have to say that it wasn't that much my case, but it's something that I saw like the people around me, and uh, it was especially about the the grades. Like people were really crazy about grades. It was especially for the law department, maybe because you know they have this law firm that, that uh, they have to take them and whatever. But also in the equity department, I saw people like yeah, because I need a great grade, and also my master thesis has to be wonderful. I mean. And something I saw after the college is like no one cares about your grades. So I mean, don't worry. I mean, you have pass the exams, do it uh, correctly. But I mean, don't believe that uh, just because having better grades, you will have a better position. You will see a lot of you will apply maybe for the blue book and uh, these kind of uh, institutions, and you will see like I don't know maybe people having worse grades than you will have the the, the jobs and you won't. So oh, maybe don't stress that much, uh, like uh, being trying to be perfect academically, and maybe just yeah, try to enjoy more your your network and your friends and making connection in the college that I think is much more important. I cannot hear you, John, but I saw in the chat that there's a question about grades, no? We have a question in the chat. If Gaëtan would like to ask his question too. Euh, oui, merci. Bonsoir. J'ai une question pour euh, Corina, enfin deux même. Euh, D'abord, est-ce que vous avez un contrat du durée indéterminée Je ne sais pas très bien compris euh, si c'était le cas ou pas. Et ensuite, ouais. comme vous avez une position, euh, je suppose, assez junior dans l'entreprise, est-ce que vous devez faire euh, beaucoup de back-office Quel pourcentage c'est de, de votre tâche à peu près Merci. Alors, oui, c'est un CDI. Euh, au Luxembourg, généralement, euh, même en tant que junior, euh, c'est facilement des CDI. Euh, ensuite, euh, qu'est-ce que vous entendez par back office Il y a des, des tâches pas forcément les plus euh, ah. stimulantes qu'on peut. Euh, enfin, ouais. euh, oui, oui. En tant que junior, euh, tu okay. vas un peu devoir faire tout ce que les autres ne veulent pas faire. Donc, euh, ça dépend un peu dans quelle équipe tu tombes ou dans quel, euh, ouais, quel manager tu es. Okay. Euh, mais oui, tu vois, par exemple, quand je parlais des, des, des propositions euh, pour, pour les clients, euh, ça, généralement, c'est beaucoup de, de, beaucoup de PowerPoint. Quand tu es consultant, tu fais beaucoup, beaucoup de PowerPoint. Et euh, ce qui est mis en page, etc., ça va souvent être les, les juniors, tout ce qui est toutes les tâches un peu, un, un peu, un peu fiantes. Mais d'un autre côté, euh, il faut savoir les faire parce que même quand on grandit dans l'entreprise, des fois, on se retrouve à les faire. Et plus on a fait quand on était junior, plus on est rapide par la suite. Euh, donc... Euh, mais ça dépend vraiment, euh, malheureusement, heureusement, je ne sais pas, mais ça dépend, c'est une question de chance, ça dépend vraiment avec qui tu tombes et avec qui tu travailles. Donc parfois, tu ne vas pas du tout faire cet achat et parfois, tu vas faire que ça pendant quelques mois, quelques semaines, je ne sais rien. Donc, euh, donc euh, ça dépend, mais généralement, ce n'est pas censé être ton, le cœur de ton travail parce que tu es quand même dans cette chef client la, la journée. Donc alors même chez le client, effectivement, si tu es une grande, une grande équipe, tu vas peut-être faire un peu ce que les autres ne veulent pas faire, mais généralement, tu vas quand même énormément apprendre. Et puis après, le soir, tu vas peut-être pouvoir faire deux, trois petites choses qui sont un peu plus chiantes. Mais, euh, mais ouais, ça, ça dépend. Mais pour répondre, oui, tu vas devoir faire <rire> des, des choses un peu moins sympas. Merci. Gabriel, the floor is yours. I see your question in the chat, but if you wish to, to ask it. Um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, uh, both of you, Eduardo and Corina, for uh, your presentation. It was really insightful. Uh, before before um, <clears throat> asking my question in the chat, I had a, a previous question uh, regarding societies. Um, were you, both of you, were you in societies during your year at the College of Europe? And if so, which one and to what extent did it contribute to your current position? 
Yeah, I mean, in my case, I was uh, was involved in the energy group, but I mean, I was like they said a passive member. So actually, I just joined for the funny parts. <laughs> so actually, I mean, I wasn't very much involved in the society. So and uh, that was all I was involved in, like in society. So in my case, uh, no, I, I didn't join anyone. Um, I was uh, I was leading the business club, um, and I also oh, was what well, sorry I was also part of the French society and of the Moldovan society. Um, so I don't know I don't really think that in a lot the the my career afterwards, but I think it was uh, it was really insightful. Um, at least uh, especially I would say uh, the the business club because uh, we organized a, a payments workshop. We organized a couple of interesting subjects. Uh, and separately, I was interested in, so that could that also helped me uh, dig a bit into it. Um, so I think it's it was a good uh, good opportunity for me to learn, but I wouldn't say that really influenced um, what came afterwards. Thanks, thanks a lot to both of you. Maybe I would just quickly uh, then ask my question that I, I wrote in the chats. It was more um, related to what uh, Eduardo you said about the yeah. grades and average. Um, of course, I, I, I abide by the, the, the philosophy you, you the philosophy you raised, but uh, isn't uh, an excellent average a condition for securing good PhD position at interesting institution and also to secure uh, fundings like merit-based scholarships uh, and etc. Yeah, I mean it really depends on the institution you are applying for. I mean if you are applying for a very high selective program, for sure it's important. But I mean, I would say that it's like really a specific one. I don't know, for example, in Europe, you can maybe consider UI you know, in Florence. So for them, it's really important the grades. But otherwise, I mean, in my case, and in the Netherlands, they have incredible education systems and incredible universities. And they didn't even ask me about my grades, like none of them, not in the bachelor, not in the master. So, I mean, I think it really depends on the country you are applying for and also the institution you are applying for. I mean, if it's a very high selective institution, I said, also in the US, for sure, it's I mean, really important. But if you're considered like, let's say, a normal university in Europe, I wouldn't say that it's a very, I mean, it, it's not going to make the difference having a, I don't know, a, a 20 over 20 in Belgium than having a 17, for example. But in my case, that wasn't the, that wasn't the case. Thanks. Thank you very much. David, the floor is yours if you like to ask your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my question can be answered by both, I think, but maybe mostly Corina uh, regarding to, to her current experience. And my question is very short, but I'm going to ask how do you enhance the value of the College of Europe when interviewing with companies, private, especially consultancies and other European affairs? Um, uh units of companies so how do you how do you put the college of europe ex experience a network and uh like what we actually learn here um uh in regarding to other institutions namely oxbridge but also the top top French schools as well also some coming from other countries as well like whatever in like that kind of schools how do we do we differentiate um in front of the others during interviews and during selection processes, at least at the beginning. Thank you. Um, I can answer, but my answers will be only for Luxembourg. I have not interviewed elsewhere, so um, that might differ, for instance, in, in, in Brussels. Uh, here in Luxembourg, the college is not very well known, unfortunately. So, um, you know, people, when seeing Fields of Europe, don't go, ah, okay, um, I know what you mean, I know what you did, I know the, the, the process and so on. So I had to to explain a lot what what it uh, what it is. Uh, in consultancies, having the college um, is uh, is an asset, nevertheless, because um, both in Luxembourg and Brussels, and I guess elsewhere, they they but especially in these two countries, they have a department focused on EU institutions. So um, having this uh, this EU knowledge from the College of Europe definitely helps. Um, even if you're not necessarily in this team, you can always uh, you can always help, and you can always find yourself in a project. Related to your institutions, we have a lot uh, here at Deloitte, in, especially for the EIB. Um, so that's definitely one, one one good point and one advantage when interviewing at least in Luxembourg because there are not that many people 
um, specialized in uh, in the European institutions in uh, European students studies. So um, so this is this was one advantage. Um, otherwise, um, for me, it was mostly um, in in my case. I had already a master's degree, so. When interviewing, I mostly had to justify why I chose to do another master's degree and why this master's at the college. Um, but I think they they really like they really at least in my case they really like the fact that I was specialized in, uh, in in European studies and that was definitely an advantage compared to others. But again, um, it's a Luxembourg market that's very different because of many people come with this background. So. I don't know if that fully answers your question. If you have other questions, don't hesitate. Sorry, so that Francois raised his hand. Yeah, I had a question for Corina, but um, it was related to the question of David before. Um, thanks for all your insight first, but. Um, Tu as dit que avant de aller au collège, tu étais déjà à Deloitte. Donc, c'était quoi la added value d'aller au collège Est-ce que tu as ressenti dans ton statut après à Deloitte que c'était un avantage ou c'était un, un, un bonus, mais que ça n'a pas vraiment impacté ton statut de consultante chez, chez Deloitte euh, Non, mon statut n'a pas changé. Euh, J'ai changé d'équipe, euh, mais, euh, mais mon statut ou la reconnaissance que j'avais ou quoi que ce soit, non, ça n'a ça pas du tout changé. C'est effectivement un, un bonus plus qu'un avantage en tant que tel. Euh, mais, euh, mais oui, comme je disais, euh, dans le cas où, euh, si j'avais dû bosser avec des, 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 si je dois bosser avec des institutions européennes ou quoi, euh, c'est sûr que, que j'ai un avantage que d'autres n'ont pas. Euh, mais ce n'était pas un avantage à l'embauche ou, euh, ou au début en tout cas. Thanks, merci. Gabriel if you wish to take the floor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my my question uh, is directed to Eduardo. Uh, you, you you probably provided this information during your talk, and I and I and I missed it. But um, for relating to your PhD application, when did you approximately started it? How much time did it take you to provide the entire to, to build it completely? And when did you have to submit it? To, the, uh, yeah. to attract university. I have to say that I applied to several universities. So I mean, Ultra was one of the one among the the, the university I applied. So I started. I remember the first ones uh, already in October, October, November, I guess, uh, because I had to submit it then in January. So right after choosing the topic of the thesis, I already started. In the case of Ultra, it was. Uh, it was, I think I started in March and I submitted it in April and I got the result uh, in May. I think I had the interview and all the process. Uh, and in June, I have the, the answer that they were choosing me. So uh, I will advise you like to spend uh, I mean, a lot of time doing your proposals or applications. Uh, I mean, you already did it for the college, so you have the experience uh, how to do application to top institutions. Um, but uh, I mean, now I think you are considering or maybe thinking about a PhD. Now I think you you will choose the topic of your thesis like soon, I guess. Uh, so like I think the, the the first step to do it, I will say to to try to think very well on this uh, topic on the master thesis because it's going to be your business card for the for the application to to a PhD. Uh, so pick a good topic, a good methodology, and a good supervisor. I think these are the three keys now that you will you will have to think about it. Uh, of course, like then prepare the the applications. But uh, with this, I think the the first move you you will have to do now that you are that you are there in the college. Great, thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, you're speaking about the master thesis and that uh, the, indeed, I don't have much time until Kathleen uh, just sent us uh, the proposal. Would you have maybe some tips from the inside when you were uh, writing your own master thesis at the college? Would you like to show some tips on how to manage the writing of the master thesis, the course? Or did you manage to go through everything? 
Yeah, I mean it was a it was a hard time because I mean of course you you all finish the I, I remember I finished the last day of the thesis so it's normal that you all end up uh, finishing your thesis last day, but uh, I mean for the moment now that you have to to find a topic and an advice I got from a former academic assistant in the college was like try to start reading a paper if you like the topic you know so if you you like this topic you start reading a paper and then you see the reference to another author is quoted in the paper and then you start looking to to that paper and then you you continue you know so that, that was the way for me to find the, the topic and and then try to do things like a lot in advance like also if you are doing quantitative stuff uh, try to get the data as soon as possible don't think just okay my data is in Neurostat I will find it easily no, try to do it in advance because sometimes you can be surprise about the, the data availability when you, you don't have that much time to submit the thesis. And also try to find a supervisor because, I mean, in the college you have uh, incredible supervisor and other professors that, I mean, they are this year and they are not uh, that much involved in the supervision process. So maybe try to try to get some information about uh, which supervisor or professor fits more on your topic so he can be more he or she can be more interested on your topic and yeah maybe receive more feedback during the, the writing part um i don't know if i have if i have much to add but i am my maybe my only advice would be to choose uh be to choose a topic that you enjoy because the process is going to be painful. Whatever you do, if you plan it, if you're organized, it's going to be painful anyways. But if you choose at least a topic that you're really interested in, um, it won't feel as bad. And at least you'll be interested in, in reading and in finding out more and in, in doing your research. So I think that's, uh, that's the most imp important thing. And then, yes, as Eduardo said, the supervisor, because um, uh, you, you need to, to have somebody that really gives you the, 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 the help you need and the assistance you need and the support and uh, the, the structure so um so indeed uh, try to to speak a bit to to other uh to ancien, to, to other people people from the past years to see maybe what supervisor would be best for you um also of course depending on your topic but that's uh, that's an important uh, important uh, point because i think a lot of people in my year were a bit uh, lost because uh, their supervisor was not answering so that was a bit uh, that was a bit challenging especially at the end of that stress so Can I you raise your hand if you wish to ask a question? Yes, can you hear me? Um, thank you to both of you for the, the tips and all the information that you gave us. And I actually had three questions to Eduardo. Um, the first one was actually, did you ever consider to do the PhD not as a full-time position, but while, for example, working um, or starting a different job and then doing the PhD aside? That is the first one. Um, and if yes, do you think that there's any complete universities which are better for those options rather than full-time positions? Um, and then it's more related to when it to more uh, the thesis that you were talking about, the advices for the thesis, and uh, what in the college. First is, did you uh, think about the topic when you were um, also considering that you would apply for PhDs afterwards on relating the topic to those positions? Because I guess that while you were applying to different universities, maybe your topic for the, the PhD would differ depending on the university you could um apply so was your um, master thesis topic also varying depending on like the, the university you were considering to apply for and when it comes to the supervisors would you rather um prioritize a supervisor that is more specialized on the topic that you want to write your master thesis on or someone that is maybe more involved Okay, thank you very much, Marina. Okay, to hear it from you. Uh, okay, so the first question is yes, I consider a part-time position, but in, because I'm Spanish, no, I'm in Spain it's really, really difficult to get uh, a funded uh, PhD position. 
but normally if you want to get paid, it's, it's really difficult. So, I mean, I consider the option to do it in my former university, the University of Seville in Spain, as a part-time, so you are allowed to, to be like to working in, while you are doing your PhD. For example, I consider, I have to say, like the position of academic assistant in the college, as Jan is doing, so she's doing a job as academic assistant, and at the same time, she's also doing a, a PhD. I mean, for me, it wasn't the best option. I mean, it's an option. You, you can do it. I prefer to have a contract on full time. So because I mean, I'm fully concentrated on my PhD and I would like to do that. But still, I consider it. Uh, I mean, you can do it. If you find a job that uh, gives you some time, then there is no problem. Mm, the only thing, I mean, they they told me at that, that, that time that yeah, take into account that maybe they, they differentiate, you know, you know, if you are full time, it's like you were more involved in your project. I mean, there's no way that they can know if you were a part time or a full time PSD at the end of the day. So actually, I mean, it's a way to do it. Uh, I think it would be better like just to have a contract for doing your PSD, but it's still is an option. Um, regarding the, the thesis, I mean, for me, the topic was, I mean, was the same. I mean, the, 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 for me, the central part of my thesis or regarding the PSD application were the methodology. I used a very specific methodology, which was the input output analysis. And I applied to positions that were looking for someone like who was specialized in this position. Now, for example, I am still working with this methodology. So this was the, I mean, the topics at the end of the day was varied, but the, the methodology was always the same, the one I was proposing, and then the topics related to, to that methodology. So still, I mean, you can find a, a topic and a methodology and then try to sell your, to the, to the application using the, this methodology. And regarding the supervisor, I mean, it really depends on what you need. I mean, I know people that they really want someone like giving feedback continuously and people that like to be more free and they just want, yeah, I will submit me thesis and he will or she he will uh, grade it. And I, I don't need someone telling me you have to do this or the other. So it really depends. In my case, I was really free. So actually my supervisor wasn't like a, a great uh, fan of my methodology. Still, he, he found it in, interesting and he provided me good feedback, but uh, I was really free. So until the last uh, moment, my supervisor didn't see like my thesis and how it was. It, was, it went very well actually, but uh, it really depends on what you, what you think is better for you. It, it happened the same with a PhD. I mean, you have supervisors that are continuously in touch with the a PhD students and you have uh, others that are more like free and they have like, I don't know, to a meeting twice per month or once per month. So it really depends on what you think is more important. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, since we're uh, speaking about the PhD, I'm gonna make a bit of advertising. <laughs> For the EG course of the second semester, I'm seeing that for our students, uh, I see that there is quite interest for PhD. We will organize a compact seminar from EG. It's an optional course that you can take, and it will be also so the tips, the experience uh, from the inside, all the questions you can have, some activities too. So just to inform you, this will be presented to you in November. But I'm happy to see that you have many questions both on consultancy and PhD and um, Last word in PhD, if there are more students interested in having more questions, uh, I know that last year we organized a system sessions, so uh, really dedicated to that. So let us know after the session. Um, since I don't see more questions, I'm going to ask you maybe a, a last one uh, to, to close um, uh, this uh, evening session. What, what did you learn from the college and what was the best part for you in the experience in the college? You can start if you have your answer. I, I uh, have ready. <laughs> yes. No, for me, I mean, the best thing was like to be working with uh, like uh, people from different nationalities and from different backgrounds. I mean, 
I, in our group, I was in LA, so we were just four, and we had like people coming more like political economy, or more financial economy, and also people from engineering. So I mean, it was really really cool to try to do. I mean, the research project we had in some courses like work together people from different countries and different backgrounds. And actually, I think that was a really nice uh, opportunity that the college gave me, you know, because I mean, most of the students that are now in the college will end up working in international institutions. So the way like to, to understand people from other countries and from different backgrounds that normally they have very different approach from yours, I think it was a, really a, a great opportunity to, to take it from the college. Uh, yes, um, for, for me, I think it's, it's the same as really the, the people I met. Um, it's uh, it's really an amazing year to meet so many uh, different people from, as you said, as you already said, from uh, from different backgrounds, different countries, different ways of thinking. And uh, that's definitely the, the, I would say, the best part of it, because it's a, it's a condensed year where you meet so many people at once. That doesn't happen so often. Um, so um, definitely, definitely the, the people and then um, and then so. You know, talking to so many people, having different ideas, and uh, you always uh, you always have some some interesting topics to talk about. And this challenging environment was uh, was really was really nice and something I, I miss. So so that's definitely the the, the added value that the fact that you're always always with uh, a lot of inspiring people. Well, these good words, and I will uh, invite our permanent professor Peter Kleisch to close the session. So thank you very well, Leo, for being here to like for us and for answering the questions. Okay, many thanks, Jen, and many thanks to the speakers for their insights. Um, I uh, I was hearing a lot of things of PhD, so I wanted to say a reply as well to many questions. So it's good we'll have a session later on. So we're, if people are having any curiosities, they also can come after class if they have any doubts. Um, now, talking about class, uh, just a practical announcement for tomorrow, because we will have the annual economic lecture, um, which uh, Professor Wambach from the ZEW will be speaking. Um, as the lecture is at seven, uh, from seven to eight in auditorium A1, if I'm not mistaken. And so you are not uh, just invited, but you're really urged to come. Uh, Professor Dumont told us actually that you will ask exam questions coming from the lecture so that if that's is a can be in a, a way to convince you as well to be to be present tomorrow but it, it, it's definitely one of the, the the better speakers so i know it's again an evening session but we'll, it, we will uh, getting into darker days so we'll be providing for you enough things to see okay so many thanks for the session uh, thanks to all of those who were also present uh, the next session will be in two weeks at the same hour, so again on a Tuesday at 8.30. And then we'll have two other speakers who come from other years and as well uh, on different from different backgrounds. So I hope that it will be useful for you as well. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let, let's close the session and, and see you for those who are in Rouge tomorrow and for the speakers, uh, just a virtual applause. And we will uh, hopefully also see you in Bruges at some point. Uh, when you will uh, be around again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.